if you don't want to be seen as someone attending a Dante lecture, please uh, turn off your camera immediately. Okay, uh, buonasera a tutti. Good evening, everybody, and you're all very welcome to this, the 12th uh, edition of the UCC Dante Public Lecture Series. Um, it's been running since 2011, um, but since COVID times, um, we've obviously had to move it online. Uh, and this has, I think, allowed us to reach out to a very, very different international audience and different audiences around the world uh, without, I think, sacrificing our own very loyal, very local audience as well, which is a great thing. Uh, but I should point out that we are hoping that as the restrictions here in Ireland are slowly beginning to ease throughout the month of February, that we will be able um, to to turn the final two lectures of our of our five lecture series into kind of hybrid events. So John Barnes's lecture and Valentina Mele's. Uh, but obviously the first three are going to remain online. Now it's always, for me at least, a great pleasure to open up the series. And for those of you who might be new to us, uh, we very much run uh, this lecture series as a kind of an all embracing uh, public lecture series in that we invite specialists, dantisti, scholars from other disciplines, uh, translators, poets, and other kind of creative practitioners uh, to, to come and to speak to us about Dante. And we have one golden rule, and that is that they speak uh, about Dante and they do so with passion. Now, some of you may be experiencing Dante fatigue after all of the septicentennial um, celebrations from last year. And conversely, I suppose some of you might uh, be so enthralled by this figure of Dante that you actually need more. Now, whichever one you are, we promise to make the next five weeks uh, very enjoyable for you. Because I think we've assembled a truly stellar uh, lineup of speakers. Christina Olson, will be speaking with us this evening, followed next week by Catherine Andoyo, uh, and then the following week, Ted Cacci, uh, and then we'll have John Barnes, and lastly, our very own Valentina Mele will round off the series. It's also the first time that the series has more women speakers than, than men, and I think that's a cause for celebration, or at least I think it is a step in the right direction. Now, before we begin, I, I want to thank my colleagues in the Department of Italian here at UCC for their continued and unstinting support. CASELAC, that is the Centre for Advanced Studies in Languages and Cultures uh, here at UCC, and also the Society for Italian Studies. And most especially, I want to thank the CDSI, that is the Centre for Dante Studies here in Ireland, all my colleagues uh, who worked very, very hard and did tremendous work last year. It was really quite exceptional. Um, and this series now runs under the aegis of the CDSI. Uh, and lastly, I just want to thank also Marco Amici, uh, who yet again provided us with an excellent poster. Um, and so to um, this evening's speaker. Christina Olson is Associate Professor at George Mason University in the US. Uh, her main research field is the Tre Corone, that is the Three Crowns of Italian Literature, Dante, Boccaccio, and Petrarch. And she reads these works, their works, through the lens of history, through politics, and gender. Her current book project, The Material Afterlife, Dante's Sartorial Poetics, examines dress and ornamentation in Dante's works as an essential part of his whole poetic enterprise. Her first monograph, monograph is the splendid courtesy lost uh, Dante Boccaccio and the Literature of History with University of Toronto Press in 2014 which reads Dante's influence on Boccaccio through the lens of cortesia that is chivalry or courtliness in the late medieval period. Together with Christopher Kleinhens she edited the volume Approaches to Teaching Dante's Divine Comedy uh, with the Modern Language Association's Approaches to Teaching World Literature series in 2020 and she is currently the president of the American Boccaccio Association. She is an associate edit editor for Digital Dante and serves also on the editorial boards of Dante Studies and Biblioteca Dantesca. And she was also vice president of um, the Dante Society of America from 2016 to 18. I'm absolutely delighted to have Christina here as our first speaker. It's a genuine pleasure. Uh, and the title of her talk this evening is Si che la ripa che era per izoma dal mezzo in giù, um, Inferno 31, 61 to 62, Nimrod, Original Sin and Artifice. Christina. 
Thank you so much, Dara, for that very generous introduction. And I'd like to start, of course, by thanking the Center for Dante Studies in Ireland, the Department of Italian at UCC and Cazalac for the very generous invitation to present on my current research on Dante and clothing. And again, a very special thanks to Dara for this invitation. I've been very grateful to Dara for our correspondence on Dante during these pandemic times, one of the boons, of course, of having been you know, shuttled to the virtual realm. And it is a pleasure for me to be here with you all, even if it is virtual and even if we do have Zoom and perhaps even a bit of Dante fatigue. So let me share my screen with you all. And here we are. So what I'm sharing today comes from my current book project, which is tentatively titled The Material Afterlife, Dante's Sartorial Poetics. It is a common understanding, of course, that clothing constitutes a visual language communicating status, ethnicity, and gender. The premise of my current project is that Dante transforms the visual language of clothing into an ethical and political language that undergirds the Commedia and several other works. In this current book, I analyze this sartorial allegory for its literary and visual antecedents to understand the poem in new ways. I've already presented a bit of my research on belts in the Commedia, from the appearance of Farinata to the belts and cords of Guido de Montefeltro and of the pilgrim himself, to the cinchings of hell's rings and the girdled spheres of the heavens. Today, instead, I'm going to delve into Perizoma, not thongs, mind you, and apologies for any disappointment in that respect, of course, but loincloths, both material and abstract. So today I'll begin with the very invention of clothing, which one might even argue occurred contemporaneously with the invention of sin. When Eve and Adam lost their innocence, they fashioned for themselves a kind of botanical apron or loincloth out of fig leaves, as the Greek word for this object, perizomata, has been translated. And we have this here in the slide in translation from Genesis 3-7, King James Version, when, and the eyes of them both were opened, and when they perceived themselves to be naked, they sewed together fig leaves and made themselves aprons, perizolata. This then is the first literary representation, one can argue, of clothing, at least certainly it is in the Bible, preceding the clothes fashioned by God out of animal skins, which we learn about in Genesis 3-21. So importantly, man-made clothing comes before divinely made, made clothing, a point that is going to be very relevant to my talk when talking about human art and divine art. So it is important to understand the significance of this object for those reasons, but also for the lexical choice that Dante makes when he includes an abbreviated form of that word that is perizoma instead of perizomata. And to appreciate this, the particularity of this lexical choice, we can consider how in Dante's times, undergarments were of course more substantive than loincloths made of fig leaves, for which I'm sure they were very grateful. The, these undergarments consisted of multiple items, the tunic, the camicia, worn by both sexes, as well as the undergarments, the brache, worn by men, which girded their lower torso from the waist and extended sometimes to the knees. When Dante discusses undergarments, however, he never mentions the mundane brache, unlike, of course, Boccaccio, and I'd be remiss not to bring him in here, who repeatedly features them in his works, such as in eight, eight, um, five, excuse me, with the Marcus and judge who is freed of his underwear while sitting on the bench, or in 9-2 with the abbess who reprimands Isabetta for fornication while wearing her lover's breeches on her head. Dante, again, never refers to brache as such. Instead, he refers to perizoma, he will refer to the camicia as well, but in ways that integrate, I would argue, iconography and material realities with diverse religious contexts. 
the metaphorical image of the pitied soma, as well as belts and girdles, described the physical and non-corporeal structures in his geography of the afterlife. But unlike belts and girdles, the Perizoma evokes a different series of moral and artistic issues intrinsic to the commedia, pride, original sin, and the tension between human artifice and divine creation. So the canto in which we find the Greek word for this original garment, the Perizoma, is of course in Inferno 31, which we will examine in detail in a moment. It appears in a context that is full of references to belts and infernal enclosures. The transition to the lowest circle of hell necessitates the climbing out of one infernal enclosure, the girdled eighth circle, to arrive in the ninth circle, where its main inhabitants, the giants, are bound in chains. The pilgrim and Virgil leave the Misera Wallone, the dismal valley of the last Bolgia in the eighth circle by climbing over the bank that girdles it, as we can see here in this quote. Noi demo doso misero valone su per la ripa che il cinge di turno attraversando senza alcun sermone. The bottom halves of the giants, Nimrod, Ephialtes, Briarius, and Antaeus are anchored in the central hole of hell from the navel down to their feet. And I quote from Inferno 31 here. E son nel pozzo intorno della ripa dall'umbelico in giuso tutti quanti. In this sense, they resemble Farinata de Uberti, who is introduced as the soul who can be observed from the belt up. Vedi la Farinata che si dritta Che si è dritto dalla cintola in su, tutto il vedrai. So here we have the bodies of the giants in the slide, and here an image of Farinata. The bodies of the giants, like Farinata, are thus visually divided horizontally at the waist, with their upper halves visible. That these are the bodies of giants, however, and I'll have us look at them while I'm speaking about them. That these are the bodies of giants is not known to the pilgrim since the light is so faint that he cannot see well ahead. Instead, the pilgrim believes that he sees a city with several high towers, such as the fortress of Monte Regioni in Siena, which was built in 1213 to protect the city against Florence's attacks, and circled by a wall with 14 towers, and that was between 1260 and 1270. Virgil corrects the pilgrim, stating that these are not towers, but giants. Yet the image of the multiple towers is important to the poet, as we observe here in the repetition of the word in its substantive and verbal forms, and I'm quoting verses 41 to 43. Come sulla cerchia tonda, monte regioni di torri so corona, così la proda che il pozzo circonda torre Gevan. And Teus, the giant who will carry the pilgrim and his guide down to the ninth circle, is likened, as many of you will know, to another important medieval tower, the Garizenda Tower of Bologna. Erected in 1110, the Garizenda is located alongside another important tower, that of the Asinelli, both in the Piazza of Porta Ravigiana. Built by powerful families throughout communal Italy between the 10th and 13th centuries, historians such as Carol Lansing have shown how towers symbolized power, their differentiated heights serving as indices of the magnitude of a given family. They were the urban architectural display of familial pride, of superbia. In that sense, towers were contemporary analogs to the mythological giants whose hubris motivated them to rebel against Jupiter. With these towers, we are introduced to the theme of human construction, artifice and building that undergirds this transitional canto, a theme that will be highlighted by the legend of the Babylonian king described here in this canto, Nimrod, Nimrod. 
His architectonic display of hubris, the construction of the Tower of Babel, affronted God in its arrogance and ambition. Dante's Nimrod, not just a king, but a giant, brings together the arrogance of giants and the arrogance displayed by towers. Whereas Anteus and Fialtes and Briarius are mythological giants, Dante follows the Vulgate and also casts Nimrod as a giant. Nimrod is described as the mighty hunter before God in Genesis 10.9, but it's the Vulgate Bible that indicates that Nimrod was a giant, right, Gigas. The Pitizoma serves as a metaphor for the inner bank of the eighth circle, which covers Nimrod from his waist down. At the upper part of Nimrod's torso is the place where a mantle would be clasped. Three Frieslanders, reputed to be the tallest of all humans in those times, could not span this breadth from the collarbone to the navel, measured at 30 large palms. The figurative cinching of Nimrod's waist and the clasping of the mantle around his neck define the giant's body and at the same time map the spaces of hell in corporeal terms. And I'll read this quote that's here in the slide. La faccia sua mi pare lunga e grossa come la pina di San Pietro a Roma, e sua proporzione era l'altra ossa. Sì che la excuse me, sì che la ripa, che era per i zoma dal mezzo in giù, ne mostrava ben tanto di sovra, che di giugnere alla chioma tre frison si averien dato malvanto. Però ch'io ne vedea trenta gran palmi dal loco in giù dove uomo affibbia il manto. Dante conflates many traditions and legends in Nimrod's appearance here in Inferno 31. Firstly, by following the Vulgate's description of Nimrod as a giant, as I noted earlier, he associates him with the original giants who rebelled against Jupiter, those ancient figures of hubris. Secondly, by girding the nonsense speaking Nimrod in this canto, whose act of rebellion led to the confusion of languages with a figurative pirizoma and a mantle, Dante of course associates clothing with language itself. As I said earlier, it's often said that clothing constitutes a visual language, a system of signs. Nimrod's pirizoma and his mantle also relate to the, this conflation of clothing with language, but with a different sensibility. Nimrod embodies the linguistic diversity of clothing with a perizoma, which is etymologically an ancient undergarment and a mantle, which is a contemporary and exterior symbol of status and authority that was ubiquitous in Dante's times. Like the reference, excuse me, <clears throat> like the reference to the span of Nimrod's body, give me one second. Like, like the reference to the span of Nimrod's body, these tercets span from the literary origins of clothing to contemporary fashion realities. Or you could say from clothing as a literary and iconographic symbol to a contemporary object. The sources for Nimrod's Perizoma are both ancient and secular. Genesis 3.7 in the Vulgate, as well as visual sources, namely the Imago Pietatis, are certainly at play here. Of course, by the Imago Pietatis, I'm referring um, to the image of the crucified Jesus with the loincloth around his body. Dante truncates Perizomata, this Greek word which you should know appears untranslated in the Vulgate to describe the primitive aprons of Adam and Eve. This term is an ancient term that has a very rich lineage in Etruscan and Greek art history, which we can see evidenced in the Perizoma vases that depict athletes who often wore Perizomata exclusively during sport. This term is the only authentic Greek term in the Commedia. In addition to perizomata, Dante adopts other words of technical Greek origin, as well as his Greek neologisms, 
such as his term for the purgatorial river, Ilnoe, to identify it. There's also, of course, antomata, which is a term that he uses in Purgatorio 10 to describe the vegetal, the vegetable matter, the grub that he got, we believe, from Aristotle's De Generatione Animalium. And in the Convivio, he refers to Hormen, Autentin, and Antictona. This is of a special interest, especially to me at least, because, for example, he, Dante will use the Latinized word for belts, zona, which originates in the Greek zone, to describe the heavens in particular. And here we have a quote from Paradiso 29, in which we see an example of that. Quando ambedue i fili di latona coperti del montone della libra fanno dell'orizzonte insieme zona. Dante's source for the sartorial lexicon of Perizoma would have been Isidore of Seville's etymologies, as I would argue, especially for the clarification that we get from Isidore, the coverage that a loincloth would provide for the area under the waist. Here, as we can see in this quote, he defines this item of clothing as that which would be located under the belt. So it's very important because Isidore differentiates and I'll just note before I read this quote that in the commentary tradition, there's often a lot of conflation between pel belts and perizoma where they're seen as almost the same thing. So, and I quote here from book uh, 19, humankind's most ancient article of clothing was the loincloth, perizoma, that is the subcinturium with which only the genitals are hidden. The first mortals made these for themselves at first from tree leaves, because they were blushing after their disobedience and hid their private parts. Some barbarian peoples still wear them up to the present day since they are unclothed. These are also, call, also called campestria because young men exercising unclothed on a field, a campus, cover their private parts with these same loincloths. And by the way, I will just note that the idea that other peoples um, that are connoted with this very derogatory idea that these other barbarian peoples all wear these is an idea that we also can find in Petrarch's De Vita Solitaria. So back to Isidore. While Isidore's entry might appear too general to lead to its identification as a source for Dante here in Inferno 31, its context here in the etymologies and in this specific chapter, as you'll see down here below, de navibus edificis et vestibus, suggests the associations of clothing and construction, which are raised by Nimrod, of course, in the Tower of Babel. And I don't think that this has been noted. Moreover, it invites us to remember that Nimrod as a builder should be considered as an artist. Isidore begins this book, book 19, with the following statement. In turn, I have applied myself to the terms for specific skills by which something is made, terms for the tools of the artisans or whatever proves useful to them, and anything else of this sort worth pointing out. A very sort of copious type of introduction. Isidore proceeds to treat the construction of ships, buildings, and clothing, since these are man-made objects, their art. The first Pirizoma, as Isidore writes accordingly, was made by Adam and Eve out of fig leaves, and this comes a bit later in this chapter. And then he notes God fashioned tunics to cover Adam and Eve more fully. And I'm going to digress here for a moment to say that I have learned from my friend who is a Quranic scholar that in the Quran, in fact, God dresses them with feathers and not animal skins, which is something that I'm going to be looking into myself. So back to Isidore and what Dante, I believe here is doing perhaps with Isidore. By including Nimrod with the Perizoma, Dante is emphasizing human art right, and not God's art together with, with its association of sin and shame in these verses. So in this measure, Dante is deviating slightly from both scriptural and medieval traditions of Nimrod. Nimrod's territories in Genesis book 10 are defined as those of Babel, Erech, and Akkad in the land of Shinar, and Nineveh, Rehoboth, 
Kala and Resin in Assyria. The description of the Tower of Babel in Genesis 11, right after that clarification of his territories, does not mention Nimrod. It claims that migrants arrived in Shinar from the east and decided to build a city and a tower that reached to the heavens in order to gain fame. And this from book 11 of Genesis. Their ambition was thwarted by God and humankind was inflicted with the multiplicity of languages, Babel, that led to a lack of comprehension among themselves. So it's important to keep in mind that differentiation there that is actually in the scriptures, that we don't have the Tower of Babel explicitly associated with Nimrod there. Most likely influenced by, among others, Augustine's, excuse me, Augustine's portrait of the Babylonian ruler in De Civitate Dei, Dante believed that Nimrod was responsible for the construction of the tower, which is revealed in the giant's two other appearances in the Commedia, as well as in the De Vulgari Eloquentia. And here we'll take a look at, um, at Augustine here in translation. Hence, it may be inferred that Nimrod the giant was its founder, as was briefly suggested earlier. For when the scripture mentions him, it says that the beginning of his empire was Babylon. That is, Babylon was the city which had the preeminence over all the others, where the king's dwelling was in the metropolis, so to speak although it was not finished on the great scale, which their arrogant impiety had in mind. So here Augustine's making that connection. As one example of pride punished on the first terrace of purgatory, Nimrod is figured as lost, smarito, like the pilgrim in Inferno II, at the foot of his great work. And here I'll quote from Purgatorio 12. Vede nembrot a pie del gran lavoro, quasi smarito, e riguardar le genti che insenar con lui superbi foro. Dante's portrait of Nimrod as an artist can also be found, as I said earlier, in the De Vulgari Eloquentia, where the poet highlights how the king sought to surpass both nature as well as nature's maker. And here we'll look at Baderol's translation. Incorrigible humanity, therefore, led astray by the giant Nimrod, presumed in its heart to outdo in skill, not only nature, but the source of its own nature, who is God, and began to build a tower in Sinar, which afterwards was called Babel, that is confusion. By this means, human beings hope to climb up to heaven, intending in their foolishness, not to equal, but to excel their creator. Uh, one thing that I find interesting about Baderol's translation, which I value very highly, is that Nimrod, the name Nimrod is actually not in the original uh, Latin text. So he, he inserts it here. It is assumed that we understand that we're speaking about Nimrod, at least uh, Baderol made that, that interpretation. It is Nimrod's last textual appearance in Paradiso namely in the words of Adam, which explicitly merges the textual loci first put forward in Inferno 31, the Garden of Eden, the Tower of Babel, and the figure of the artist. While Nimrod bears the sign of original sin in Inferno 31, Adam here in Paradiso speaks against their shared hubris their trespassing of the boundaries set by God, right? the trapassar del seno. While one of Dante's questions of Adam concerns the first language spoken by man, and this is in verse 114, and I should note that, in fact, matters of language are emphasized in the De Vulgari Eloquentia when he treats Nimrod, as we saw. Here in Paradiso, it is equally a discussion of man made art. Adam's criticism of Nimrod and the Tower of Babel, the ruler's inc inconsummable work, is that anything constructed by human reason cannot be long lasting. And here I'll read Paradiso uh, from the slide, Paradiso 26. La lingua che io parlai fu tutta spenta, inanzi che all'ovra inconsumabile fosse la gente di Nimrod attenta. 
chi nullo affetto mai razionabile, per lo piacere umano che rinovella, seguendo un uccello, sempre fu durabile. Nimrod did not understand the limitations of human art. His tower should have connected the earth with the sky, but it would not succeed in doing so, of course. In contrast, the ladder built by God for Dante's ascent from the earthly paradise to heaven, mentioned by Adam himself, succeeds in that measure since it is divinely made. Here I quote again from Paradiso 26. Tu vogli udir quant'è che Dio mi pose nel eccelso giardino, ove coste a così lunga scala ti dispose. Just as this divine ladder contrasts with the fallen tower of Nimrod's thwarted artistic ambitions, so does the presentation of Adam reinforce the superior, superiority of divine art over human art, and he does so in sartorial terms. If Genesis 3.21 notes that God made tunics for Adam and Eve, implying the deficiency of the fig leaf loincloths, then the language introducing Adam in Paradiso refers to the gonna, the gown, and not the pil perizoma. The, the pilgrim's visual spirit attempts to see Adam's bright image, but must permeate the membranes of the eye, whose layers are called gowns, as we see here in this quote. E come a lume acuto si disonna per lo spirito visivo che ricorre allo splendor che va di gonna in gonna. The sartorial language in this passage continues. After Dante addresses Adam, the primal soul moves within the rays covering him, the, which is a coverta, like an animal that moves beneath his skin. And here we have verses 97 to 102. Talvolta un animal coverto broglia, sì che l'affetto convien che si paglia per lo seguir che face lui l'envoglia. E similmente l'anima primaria mi facea trasperer per la coverta quando ella a compiacermi venia gaia. The heavenly body of Adam is thus not one that experiences the shame of physical nudity but one described in the terms of its primitive, one could say animalistic origins, as well as the God-given layers and not the man-made ones meant to protect it. That is the God-given layers from Genesis. His divine corporeality does not involve a pirizoma, that marker of shame, sin, and human invention. That marker, that sign, Senyo of the Perizoma belongs instead to the body of Nimrod that bears it, the sign of Adam's sin, as well as the eternal burden of his own. There is yet another aspect to the damnation of Nimrod as artist. The literal banks of the circle which function as the Perizoma are not man-made. Instead, like the rest of hell, they are divinely made as we learn from the inscription to hell from Inferno 3, which emphasizes the role of God as divine artificer, as we all remember. Giustizia mosse il mio alto fattore, feci mi la divina podestate, la somma sapienza, il primo amore. Dinanzi a me non fur cose create se non eterne, e io eterno duro. Even this perizoma is divinely made, further undoing Nimrod's role as artificer. Nimrod, of course, is not the sole artist whose trespassing of the sign was thwarted by the divine and who, whose hubris is marked by dress. Arachne, another example of fallen pride, wove textiles herself, but in her pride challenged the prowess of Minerva and was consequently punished. This is this, what we get, of course, from the meta, what Dante gets from Metamorphoses, Book Six. And here I quote from Purgatorio 12. O folle ragne, si vedea io te già mezza ragna, trista in sulle stracci, dell'opera che mal per te si fe. 
Like Nimrod at the base of his incomplete work, Arachne is depicted as half transformed into a spider amongst the tatters, the strachi of the work, rent by a vindictive god, work which he had, quote unquote, wrought to her own hurt, to quote uh, Ovid's Metamorphoses here. Dante's phrase could also refer to the legend that Arachne, having been beaten by Minerva with a shuttle, hung herself. Human attempts to create art are considered so foolish as to comprise self-destructive acts. If Nimrod bears Adam's sartorial sign for sin, then the sartorial signifier for Arachne's artistic hubris is not found on her body. However, they are said to be inferior to the woven designs and the bestial figure of Gerion from Inferno 17. Con più color somesse sovraposte, non fer mai drappi tartari ni turchi, ne fur taitele per aragni imposte. Dante this adds yet another defeat to Arachne's techne. She's punished by Minerva for being technically superior, but Dante names her skills as inferior to the ones divinely made by God for Gerion's body. Dante thus posits God's superiority as an artificer with the textile and building arts. His craft is better than that of Adam and Eve, who are redressed with tunics, Nimrod, whose tower is inferior to that which he had built from the pilgrim, and Arachne, whose textiles pale in comparison to Gerion's coat. And as last seen here in the case of Gerion, God's art claims primacy over the textiles produced in the East. The competition of artistic skill extends beyond the dichotomy of human and divine to the lines of ethnic identity between the Judeo-Christian and the Eastern. In this way, the reference to Tartar and Turkish cloths unites Arachne with Nimrod in yet another sense as they both originate in the East. Arachne was the daughter of a wool dyer, Idmon of Colophon from Asia Minor. Nimrod as the king of Shinar in Babylonia represents alterity in ways that make the figurative presence of the Perizoma on his body a jarring transposition of the sins of one race to another. Dati conflates an item of Judeo-Christian significance with yet another instance of human pride and ships such association of original sin fully to the Babylonian ruler from the Near East. In contrast, Adam is the ancient father to whom every bride is daughter and daughter-in-law, quoting from Paradiso 26, antico padre a cui ciascuna sposa figlia nuro. This racial difference is linguistic as well, for Adam's tongue was long extinct before the time of Nimrod. Remember, la lingua che io par parlai fu tutta spenta. Nimrod's utterance in Inferno 31, verse 67, Raphael mai ameche zabialmi, is deliberately coded as linguistic nonsense. Yet, as Richard LeMay has argued, can be alternately understood as mangled Arabic. As an additional sign of Nimrod's otherness, Dante compares the king's monstrous size to elephants and whales as fellow instruments of Mars, the former dwelling in lands other than Italy and of whom he could have only read about in bestiaries. Most importantly for Dante, Nimrod was not only a figure of pride and transgression, but also as Alison Cornish has explored, an Arab astrologer as the tradition from the Libra Nemroth would have conveyed. So the Babylonian ruler's Eastern identity must impact our interpretation of the perizoma that he figuratively wears. It gives new meaning, I would argue, to the juxtaposition between Nimrod and Adam and to the ways in which Dante has one of these figures bear the visual sartorial signifier of sin. Furthermore, such a consideration offers new thoughts for what it means to juxtapose Arachne's art with that of the Tartars and the Turks, whose prowess comes last syntactically. 
Dante implies the agency of foreign producers and weavers that contrast with a few references to the actual textile arts in the Commedia. One with a noteworthy resonance to the Lieber Nemroth is among the diviners and astrologers of Inferno 20. Here, as you'll recall, Dante describes those sad women who had left uh, their needle, shuttle, and spindle, right, to become diviners. As in the case of Arachne, the act of weaving is depicted as interrupted. More importantly, weaving is also considered as an associated practice to the aping of divine art or vision, thereby reinforcing the almost casual connection between hubris and the textile arts. To weave well can instill a temptation to challenge the divine. In contrast, to work at the spindle uninterrupted, as Cacciaguida will recount for Florence, is a sign of civic tranquility. E vidi quel di nerli e quel del vecchio esser contenti alla pelle scoperta e le sue donne al fuso e al penecchio. Metaphorically, heavenly conversations are figured by Dante as the act of weaving, either when the pilgrim sets the warp through which Cacciaguida could set his woof, as in Paradiso 17, or when the pilgrim waits to learn from Picarda as to how the finished textile of her speech will appear when she has finished pulling her shuttle through it, as we have here in Paradiso 3. One positive example of textile production evokes an idealized Florentine past, while yet another example features a Florentine woman's speech as weaving itself. Two of these examples relate to Cacciaguida too, not only Dante's ancestor, but as a crusader, a figure of aggression and militaristic dominance over the East itself. So to conclude, the classical idiom that appears here in this canto, Perizoma, complicates the appearance of Nimrod, Babylonian king, even further by evoking the scriptural and sartorial origins of sin and humorous. By likening the bank around Nimrod's waist to this essential object of original sin, Dante reminds us of the hubris and vulnerability involved in art, not to mention the very many issues at stake in human language. One word, perizoma, prompts a reflection upon the acts of signification and creation and how signifying and creating inform the tension between the human and the divine. Thank you very much. I look forward to your thoughts. Thank you, Christine. That was wonderful. Uh, really was excellent. And uh, I'm sure there are going to be uh, many, many questions after that. Um, I'm just going to ask you a very general question, just to kind of waiting for people to kind of formulate their own, uh, obviously more, more, more general ones. And I'm just thinking because you made the connection there between um, um, shipbuilding, uh, architecture, uh, construction, uh, uh, and obviously kind of garments and textiles and things. Obviously, shipbuilding and ship metaphors are very important for the for, for the for the kind of poetics of the poem, um, and Obviously, the, the whole kind of textile textual relationship is obviously going to be very strong. Dante is going to be using use some examples there. Um, but do you see, for example, I mean, if you kind of shoot forward to kind of Paradiso 32 and the famous, you know, um, sartorial, you know, qui in punto come bon sartore, uh, is this kind of self-reflexive image of, of the poem itself. Is there anything that in what you're talking about, specifically with the Nimrod episode, because I know it's a very complex question, and you, and you brought in Gerione, who's obviously seen in some quarters as, as a kind of a, um, a symbol for kind of the, the, the Menzogna Poetica, but is there anything in the Nimrod area, specifically with his, his relationship to, to language and the Confusio Linguarum, that would relate to the, the poetics of the poem or the construction of the poem itself? That's a very good question. Very interesting question, Dara. So um, 
in terms of certainly the multiplicity of languages that we find in the poem, right? The different registers, right? Certainly there is a confusione de la, you know, de la lingua that we find within the commedia, and we can't deny that. Um, so in, in this sense, and of course, you know, this is what Teo Barolini talks about in chapter six of the Indivine, right? In, in many ways here, the, the poet is putting forth different figures, right? As foils for himself, as an artificer, who will go, you know, go beyond the sign, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and he won't get punished for it, but others will. Adam, right, 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 exactly, yes. So, um, so no, certainly the poet himself is implicated in all of this. Also, you bringing up the shipbuilding, Dara. I'm going to be very grateful to you for. I did not mention Ulysses. Now, Ulysses not as a, you know, not as a shipbuilder necessarily, but certainly very much involved within this idea of. Construction, artifice, you could take it further, Penelope weaving. Of course, there's tons of literary representations of weaving, but here what, what I'm really interested in is how it's it raises issues of um of hubris and the tension between the human and the divine, at least for this part of the chapter. But thank you for the, for those thoughts. Brilliant. Thank you, Dara. Thank you. Our first question comes from uh, Carol Kyodo. Carol, see your hand is raised there. Yes. Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Uh, Christina, thank you so much for this wonderful, wonderful talk and very thought provoking also, I might add, um, because I, I've kind of run along with the assumptions of sort of the mechanical arts as being something that, you know, pulling on, pulling the threads of Hugh of St. Victor, continuing through. And so an idea of a pr improvement of humanity, right? Aiming towards this improvement and then pulling through even Bonaventure's, the reduction of arts to theology. So this Franciscan kind of elevation of uh, even more, even further of these servile arts. And I think you've, you've made a really persuasive case for how Dante really complicates that, particularly with the figure of, of um, Nimrod. So what I'm wondering is how much do you feel like this conversation across the mechanical arts, because in 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 raising textiles, you are raising you know shipbuilding. You're raising a culinary thing. How much of that do you feel is um, exclusive to the mechanical art? You know, to this general idea of the mechanical arts, and how much of it is really sort of within the warp and the weave of textiles. Nice, nicely done. And with the reference there to textiles. Thank you, Carol, for that. That is a very good question. And um, I will confess that I haven't really extended the consideration to the other mechanical arts yet. So I don't want to get ahead of myself in what I'm claiming here. But what I will say is that I think, and I, you know, we saw this with Nimrod here. In other parts of this chapter, which I just gave you sort of an excerpt, um, Dante's relationship with textiles is very fraught for numerous reasons, because it becomes a symbol also of a corrupt clergy, it becomes a, and mainly through the Tartar cloths, right? So the Tartar cloths to which Jerian's code are related, right, are, you know, likened, right, are an interesting issue, right? For Dante, they kind of symbol, that they are the symbol of this item of commerce that comes from the East within material practical realities of what is being made within Italy, we have you know, industries and centers of production imitating the patterns that are found on Tartar cloths, right? What's called the tiny pattern. So there's a tension between East and West that's happening through textiles and a, in a lot of discussions And here, perhaps I'm sort of digressing going far off from your question, but in discussions of textiles within the Tre Corone, Inevitably, it becomes a discussion of someone from the East, Sardanapalus, Semiramis, Nimrod. Semiramis for Boccaccio invented underwear. This is in the Mulieribus Claris because she had to invent a chastity belt for her son so that the other woman in the court wouldn't sleep with him. Right, and he sees this as the beginning, as the invention of underwear, which is a really unusual way of seeing the invention of underwear because it's a chastity belt. But in any case, 
what I'm what I'm noticing is that there is this ethnic tension that happens in talking about textiles. Um, now, I think what your point is a very good one. How this extends to the other mechanical arts is something that I have to go into further. Um, and I'd be open if someone has already sort of, you know, considered this in ways that I'm just sort of looking over now as a blind spot, please do let me know. So thank you, Carol. Okay, I know, I know Simone, you asked a question in the chat, but you also put up your hand, so you might as well ask, ask this one now. Okay, Simone. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Christina, for your wonderful talk. I, I want to... Um, I would like you to speak a little more if you if you want and uh, uh, if you think it's the right time um, about a political dimension uh, that you touched upon uh, at, at the you know, close of your uh, of your uh, talk and uh, um, I'm looking at uh, uh, I'm thinking you, you, the Genesis uh, scene made me think of uh, a sort of a typological connection, uh, the sewing together of uh, uh, Adam and Eve, uh, uh, Adam and Eve's uh, uh, perizoma or perizomata, um, uh, recalls uh, in contrast the inconsutilis uh, uh, tunica, the uh, you know, Christ's uh, own garments, which are not sewn together. So there's a political, because Dante uses it in monarchia, if I'm not mistaken, uh, to talk about uh, the unity of, let's call it power. Uh, um, and, uh, you know, that he sees in the, in the, in the Roman um, tradition. So is there something you want to say about this? Uh, is this part of your horizon sure. of research? It's on the, it is, yes, it's in the horizon. It's in this chapter when I get to the Kamicha and the chemise. And of course, yes, Christ's seamless garment is very important to this. And, you know, and Boniface's comments on this are very important, right? That, that image, but we also have as another, and this is going off from the political, but there's also, you know, the sacred chemise of the Virgin Mary, right? So the, the chemise is usually a symbol of integrity, Right. In in the uh, Divine Comedy, of course, it is Virgil who is reduced down or likened to a mother who doesn't think about right her clothing when there's a fire and rushes off and takes him. Right? So it always has a very positive valence, the chemise, OK, for, for Dante. Contrast that with the mantle, the most, you know, the, the most external garment, which becomes a which becomes a symbol very much so in the inferno of corruption, right? Because it is likened obviously to the papal mantle or think about, you know, think about the hypocrites who have their leaden mantles, right? So we have the, this idea of corrupt authority. Of course, it's the mantles that are made of the tartar cloths, right? For popes and the papacy. So I believe that it, for him, it dwells within that sphere there, but it also depends upon what part of the, the poem you're looking at. What Dante tends to do is with the same item, with the same sartorial item, when he gets to Paradiso, of course, it takes on a much more positive connotation, right? As in the, the, the belts that don't divide, but that unite in Paradiso, the mantles that are representations of, of church or state corruption, but that instead enclose and protect within Paradiso. So in many, you know, Dante uses these, these symbols to signify in different ways, depending upon where we are in the poem, in what context we find ourselves. But I'm glad that you brought up the seamless garment because it is, it is for, you know, a part of this whole thing of sort of underwear, right? <laughs> this chapter is all about underwear and the chemise, so the perizoma, the camicha, and the mantle. Thank you, Simone. Julia, you have a question? Yes. Um... In Brunetto, uh, this is a text that was taught to Dante and so forth. This is what he says. Nembrot lo gigante, quel nembrot edifica la torre di Babel in Babilonia, ove avvenne la diversità del palare e la confusione del palare e vuole di linguaggi. E Nembrot medesimo muto la sua lingua di ebreo in caldeo, et allora senando eli in Persida, in Persia, 
Iran, pa, ma alla fine ritorno egli nel suo paese, cioè in Babilonia, Iraq, ed insegno alla sua gente novelle legge e facea loro adorare il fuoco come Dio. Uh, questo è un, uh, un uh, paragrafo nel tesoro uh, che ha molte cose su uh, Nembrot che troviamo ancora in Dante. Um, also, um, il velo di Maria nelle leggende è dato per coprire uh, come uh, parisom, uh, parisoma Cristo sulla croce. Mm -hmm. um, quando sono andata in Italia la prima volta con mio bambino uh, da un paese protestante non mediterraneo, non ho capito che di non mettere uh, le foglie dei fighi accanto delle pelle e gli italiani mi hanno fatto avere a uh, mio bambino senza <ride> vestiti, nudo. E in scherzo ho messo un foglio di figo su lui e tutti hanno detto no, 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 perché uh, l'irritazione è così grave di questo. Grazie, grazie tantissime. Gra grazie mille per queste osservazioni. Ehm che sono molto azzeccate e devo dire eh, proprio a proposito del tesoro, del tesoro, infatti, perché ho trovato che il tesoro per Dante è la fonte, o potrebbe essere, la fonte per la frase uh, dalla, cin dalla cintola in su e dalla cintola in giù, perché così uh, Brunetto parla del profeta Isaia, cioè è, è, è con questa frase che proviene appunto dal tesoro. Quindi questo è fantastico, eh, la ringrazio tantissimo perché eh, vedo che Brunetto sta diventando ancora più importante per questo progetto. Grazie, sì. sì. Next for the question is Gina. You said Gina? It yeah. sounded like Tina. Sorry. That's my evil twin sister. Um, <laughs> uh, Christina, thank you for this talk. I, I enjoyed it so much. It was so stimulating and scintillating. I love your thinking on Dante foregrounding that what you call hubris and vulnerability involved in art and artifice and um, the parallel to human language of both art in general and clothing in particular. So my appreciation, but also here's my question. Um, what do you make of Dante the poet juxtaposing so many examples of hubris, particularly artistic, with moments of his own heightened and even flamboyant poeticity? Um, Purgatorio 12 with the endless anaphoric acrostic, for example. Um, Inferno 1617, where uh, you talked about the Turks and the Tartars, that's obviously a, a moment as Badolini went on at length about, uh, just length, about um, the, 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 the meta-referential or meta-discursive role of Gerian. Um, Canto 31 of Inferno, that's on the very verge of uh, 3233. The examples write themselves, so I'll stop talking and listen. Thank you again, Christina. No, thank you, Gina. Thank you so much for this and for being here. And yes, I mean, what do I make of Dante sort of always flagrantly, um, flagrantly hiding his hubris? It seems very typical to me. <laughs> Having studied Dante with Teo Barolini, I guess for me, it's kind of second nature to, to come across this. Um, and, um, And so I'm, I'm not surprised. And the idea that he would then sort of liken himself as Dara was bringing up earlier, right? To the Sartur, to which he's putting the punto, right? Shows that, you know, behind it all, not only is he a Ulyssian figure, right? Mm -hmm. Not only is he sort of that figure of transgression that perhaps even that, that weaving is that type of, transgressive act that only he can do 
without mm -hmm. punishment, but I'd have to think about this further. It's very interesting that you're bringing it up because it's something I guess that I've always simply taken for granted, but that I should consider further. Well, those, those moments that seem to us very um, um, flamboyant, flashy, like the, um, uh, the Purgatory 12, apparently didn't really register for centuries as being particularly flashy. Um, the anaphora, yes, but the acrostic was only mentioned in print in the late 19th century. So I might be making much ado about nothing or much ado about um, the, the distortion that comes from a modern hyper attentiveness to meta, -discour meta discourse. But uh, thank you again. I'll shut up now. Let oh, the thank other you. many questioners get a word in. Thank you. Thank you, Gina. Hey, George, I see your hands up. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dara. Thank you uh, for that talk as well. It was fantastic. I, I just wanted to quickly, um, speaking of much, much ado about nothing, um, <clears throat> I just wanted to quickly ask whether you would consider whether you consider what, what you, whether you consider it important that Perezoma is only used at that one time in the whole Commedia, first of all, and second of all, that the word nem uh, nembroto or its variations is only used once in each canticle. So once in Inferno is in 31, once in Purgatory is, is it 12? Is it, I can't remember. Either once in Purgatory and once in Paradiso. And whether that kind of forms, whether, whether you might see that as something, a kind of specifically tailored kind of lexical filigree or something like that, or like whether it's a kind of artisanal thing or whether it's something that's, I, I don't know, maybe something else. Maybe there's something about kind of constructing readerly attention. I don't know I was, whether you had any thoughts on that. Thank you. Oh, no, that's wonderful. That's a lovely observation, actually. And um, so I thank you for that. And uh, yes, I think the fact that he includes it, right, only once, but that he's obviously punctuating, right, the canticles in this way, that's always a, a cause for us to sort of sit up and take notice of what's going on, right? This is what he does with Ulysses, and this is what he does with, you know, rare other other figures. But I think that this idea of punctuation, the punto again, as being sartorial instead of just simply poetic is very, very lovely. So I, I will thank you and absolutely credit you for that observation should I include it in my, in, in my book. So much appreciated. Okay, our next question comes from Matteo Pace. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you so much, Christina, for this beautiful talk that I heard snippets in other, other occasions and it always has this visual quality. I try to visualize the elements that you uh, talk about. And uh, some of the questions that I was uh, pondering while you were talking was on the relation between uh, uh, the, the, the focus that you were uh, talking about nakedness as well. And especially talking, uh, the, you mentioned something related to the etymology and the linguistic story. Uh, of some of these words. And I was thinking about the connection between uh, gymnasium, so the palestra and the nakedness, especially uh, how Dante uses palestra in uh, the rime, in the rime as a connotation of uh, uh, a battlefield, a place in which love tests the free will, libero arbitrio of the, of the subject. So I was curious if you had any kind of uh, connections between nakedness and agonistic, or battlefield in other aspects, or if you uh, want to connote nakedness in any other way. Thank you so much, Matteo, for that. Yes, and I, I feel very fortunate to have given uh, the talk on belts, right, pre-pandemic, right, in New York, uh, at Columbia. Now I feel like we're coming out of the pandemic. I can talk about Pedizoma. So uh, one of my sneaking suspicions, one of the things that I'm trying to grasp is how much we can tie in you know, Etruscan fashion realities to what it is that we're finding, right, within within Dante. Certainly for Perizoma, right, so, you know, my source for this is mainly uh, Larissa Bonfante, whose book on Etruscan dress is amazing and a classic within the field. The word Perizoma, right, though of Greek origin, is one that, it, she argues, is one that an Etruscan would know, 
right? The fact that we're dealing with these prehistoric fashion realities, right, which you were kind of touching upon here with your mention of the palestra, is something that I think is very interesting because I do believe that it's in his mind when he talks about belts, and it's the reason why he talks about zona, zone, right? You know, this is what comes up with him paradiso in particular. So it's not just contemporary fashion realities. For Dante, clothing is conceptual and it is etymological, right? And it is by using clothing that he can evoke these prehistoric worlds and, and ancient worlds that are in ways that I think that we haven't really fully explored yet, which I find really add layers of richness um, to the poem. But I, I need to go into the Rime for the palestra. Thank you. Point very well taken. Grazie, Matteo. And Cormac, you're next. Cormac, you need to turn on your mic. You're still muted. Here, no. Again. In Durandus, I think um, I have it. No, there you are. The okay. carpets are on the floor to be trampled on, the eastern carpets. And that is also the case of the tombs, spelling out warm, um, that they are trampled on. Thanks, thanks, Julia. Okay, okay Cormac. So, um, well, thanks for a wonderful talk, Christina. What I would have thought of as a sort of an interesting but minor theme, uh, as always with Dante, explodes into significance in all kinds of ways. So that, that was really wonderful. What I was uh, thinking of in, uh, in particular, I, I've sometimes wondered why Belin Chon Berti was got up in leather uh, while his wife was working on cloth work. Um, and it seems to awfully sort of macho. Um, but then it strikes me from what you were saying that leather is something we get um, from sort of creation, whereas cloths you have to make up. So the amount of art and therefore the danger of artifice and hubris and so on uh, comes in with that. But then the analogy also in that passage between Florence, which is nicely held within its Cerchia Antica and Benincion, who is who is uh, cinto di cuoio e dosso. And uh, yeah, other people going around with la pelle scoperta yes. as, a, as a really sort of, I, I suppose, um, uh, hardy and Spartan way of, of living. And the opposite of that, of that then would be the, the prelate seated on a horse with cloths covering an animal as well as himself. Yes. So that's really, that's really sort of opened up um, an idea of the, the materials and how the materials are made. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cormac, for that. Yes, absolutely. The key, the key in that description, what Teo Berlini calls, I love this phrase, the caveman chic that we find in that <laughs> canto yes. is, um, is that it's with the pelescoperta as opposed to not with the pelescope. So the idea that it is sort of rough hewn, right? Skins that mm. are not, right? So instead of something more ornate, right? It's sort of, you know, the elaborate textile designs that we would see in the mantles, in the woven mantles that are silk, usually made of silk, right? This is a very humble garment that he's wearing. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Okay, yeah. thanks, Cormac. Uh, our final question then, uh, uh, Christopher. Uh, yes, thank you. And thank you, uh, Christina. That was wonderful. Um, uh, I was thinking, um, have, you, have you looked also at, um, at verbs that indicate putting on clothing, dressing, being, being uh, decked out in? Uh, I was struck by when, uh, uh, when you mentioned the Ulysses, I was thinking that the verb fasharsi is used there to talk about the flame that essentially dresses them in which they are clothed. And I was wondering if you could make any sort of connection between the verbs that are used in certain instances indicating, uh, you know, uh, putting on clothing, taking clothing off, and if that could be worked into your general ideas. Yes, 
Thank you very much for that, Chris. Yes, because it is a very sort of lexical project, right? And very philological in the sense I'm looking at, obviously, the, the word choice that, that Dante is employing. Um, absolutely, verb, you know, verbs are very important, not just vestir, sir, vestire, but also, you know, for Bell's chingere is very important because it describes in many cases, right? The, the ripa, for example, from that quote earlier that I showed you at the beginning, the transition into lower hell, right? Kiel cinge dinturno, right? So that idea that that the land itself can gird, right? Or girdle, right? Uh, is very important. I look at that. I look at the vestir and vestirsi, but also in the past participle form of vestito. It's not only Ulysses, right? But also Guido da Montefeltro, who wore right, his, who wore his cord, right, and then exchanged it, right, for, you know, who had exchanged the warrior dress, excuse me, for, for that cord, and then now finds himself vestito in fiamme, right, so this is all, all very much connected. Um, I, I do, I do look at it, yes, to answer your question, and there are many, many examples. Um, last question, very, very last question, and we'll, we'll, we'll uh, come with Santi Matteo. Uh, thank you. And this is probably a, an obvious uh, question. It was suggested by um, Julia's quotation from uh, the Tesoro, uh, talking about Nembrot and Muto. So the, uh, the idea of mutare, to change, and the fact that mutande means that which has to be changed from Latin mutanda, right? Now, I don't know when that term uh, started to be used to refer to underwear. So coupling that, um, that idea of that which has to be changed with what, with your observation that the clothing close to the skin is okay. It's the outer layers, the mantle, that usually presents a problem. Now, in history, in fashion, I suppose in Dante's time, it's the other way around. The mutande, the fashion of mutande probably does not change from place to place from generation to gener generation, whereas the outer layers do change from city to city, from, uh, from generation to generation. So have you thought about that and applying this idea of where does sin and where does virtue reside in the changeableness, including of clothing or in the steadfastness to something, adhering uh, slavishly to something as opposed to changing. Mm. That's a lovely observation. Thank you so much. I, 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 I can't speak to how the etymology of mutande because I'm looking at brake and I'm looking at perizoma, but it's a very, very valid point that I can definitely go into carefully that I should, as you're pointing out, because it is about how these items become a part of an ethical language and whether or not they're symbols of virtue or symbols of, of vice. And in the case of Perizoma though, of course we have to keep in mind that it is also an image, a symbol of virtue in a very different context and that of the Yamago Pietatis. That complicates this reading of Nembrod, right? But that is a part of a reading that would have happened for him naturally by observing Right, many depictions of the crucified Christ wearing the the perizoma. So, I, you know, it it is complex, and it's not like you can say it always symbolizes this. It always symbolizes that. Um, to put it in in simple terms, but thank you. I will look into the uh, mutare. I think it's interesting that Dante doesn't. You know, for him, it's just underwear is one thing. It's the brake or it's the camicha, right? He's not going to get into the mundane brake. That's something that Boccaccio will do, right? That's something that, and I'm not saying that Boccaccio is the, the author of a secular world and Dante isn't. What I am saying is that there are, you know, what he, the context in which Boccaccio is going to bring that up is going to be quite different from what 
the issues that Dante is thinking about when he uses clothing as a symbol. Okay, so I hope that that is an a partial answer. Thank you, thank you, Santa. Okay, um, well, I, I, I can honestly say, uh, Chrissy, that this is the first time we've had a, a talk at our series about underwear in Dante. And it, well, <laughs> thank you for that. Thank <laughs> and, but it well. really was truly excellent. Just before we thank Christina one more time, I just want to remind you of next week's lecture. We have Catherine O'Doy from George Washington University, and she is going to be giving a lecture with the title Nature Sublime, Verbalizing the Ineffable in Dante's Commedia. And that will be at the same time, seven o'clock here in Ireland and wherever you are. I'm not really sure what time it is anywhere anymore. Um, so please just join with me one last time and just to thank Christina for a quite marvellous opening to our series and, a, and an absolutely brilliant lecture. Thank you, Christina. Well done. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you all for your observations. <laughs> Great to see you all. <laughs> Take care. Thank you, Dara.